All right. Today is Tuesday, July 26, and this is a recap for the stock market activities today. And folks, I got a good one for you tonight, and it's a lot. A lot of stuff we're going to talk about here. Lots of rants, lots of emotions about to come out. So buckle up your seat belts, and here it is. In focus tonight. What about the bombshell that we got from Shopify today? And then let's talk about the theft of taxpayer money, also known as the CHIP Act. And lastly, earnings reviews. We have important ones that we got after the bell. Let's take a look at those. But before we do that, here is the bombshell that we got from Shopify in the morning. The headline reads, Shopify lays off 10% of global staff, nearly 1,000 employees, as the CEO admits that his bet about skyrocketing pandemic growth did not pay off. Now, in this channel, we talked about the upcoming tsunami of layoffs. Folks, when these stocks crash by 70, 80, 90% from the top, you bet your ass that these companies will initiate layoffs. They don't have that cushion, that financial cushion that they can use to cover for hiring so many employees. They're going to have to cut down on their expenses. And the easiest way to do that is getting rid of employees. We also talked in this channel about the misguided decision by corporations when they responded to the supply chain problem. Demand shot up significantly higher due to the insane money printing trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars, stimmies all over the place, and we had shutdowns in factories and lockdowns, so we had a massive imbalance between demand and supply. The correct response would have been tackling demand down, because that was the primary reason why we have inflation. What's transitory is the disruption in the supply chain by lockdowns and restrictions. That was bound to be lifted sooner or later. But the Federal Reserve remained in denial, and instead of tackling the insane demand that they have created in the economy, they kept saying that inflation is transitory. And once the supply chain comes back on track, and all of these lockdowns are done with, inflation will go away. Well, inflation did not go away because, yes, supply came back to average, factories are open, Ports are open. There is no problem with the supply chain. The problem is with the insane demand that is out of whack and it is impossible for the supply chain to cope and catch up with that level of demand. But instead of realizing that, corporations decided to assume that that level of insane demand fueled by stimmies artificially, of course, is sustainable and permanent. And they made supply chain decisions based upon that by over-investing in the supply. Now they have the opposite problem where they have higher supply, but that insane level of demand is waning down and hence their margins are getting crushed and they have to resort to layoffs to improve these margins. We got the story from Walmart yesterday and today we have a confirmation from Shopify. According to the memo, which Shopify posted to its corporate website, the cuts are being made because Shopify mistakenly believed that the e-commerce pump fueled by the Thing pandemic would continue. When the Thing pandemic set in, almost all retail shifted online because of the shelter-in-place orders. Demand for Shopify skyrocketed, wrote the CEO, the genius CEO, who should be fired, by the way. Shopify has always been a company that makes the big strategic bets our merchants demand of us. This is how we succeed, he continued. We bet that the channel mix, the share of dollars that travel through e-commerce rather than the physical retail, would permanently leap ahead by five or even ten years. We could not know for sure at the time. That's bullshit. How did I know that? Anyways, but we knew that if there was a chance that this was true, we would have to expand the company to match. It is now clear that that bet did not pay off. Ultimately, placing this bet was my call to make, and I got this wrong. So, sir, you should fire yourself instead of firing employees for your mistake. But of course, this is not going to happen. The employees will end up holding the bag. Across the company, we're also eliminating over-specialized and duplicate roles, as well as some groups that were convenient to have but too far removed from building products, he wrote. The moronic CEO also added that affected employees would receive 16 weeks of severance, plus an additional week for every year of Tenshire at Shopify. Oh, how generous of you. You see where this is going? This story will be replicated across corporate America. And I know Shopify is a Canadian corporation, but it doesn't matter. You will see this story in America, in Germany, in the UK, because they all made the same mistake. Of course, the CEOs, the executives, they don't really care. 
They already dumped their stocks at the top last year. They're not holding the bag. You, as an investor in these trash companies, you're holding the bag. And you, as an employee in these companies, you're also about to hold the bag. Now, let's move on to this absurd story. Absolutely outrageous. I made a video about it the so-called CHIP Act, which is nothing more than another money laundering scheme done by your beloved politicians. That's all there is. And they use national security, quote-unquote, as a cover for their corruption. It is a $52 billion theft of taxpayer money. But wait, there was more. It got a lot better today. The Senate has advanced a $280 billion bill. Whoa. I thought we're talking about $52 billion, but magically the bill became... 280 billion today. It evolved magically, like a Pokemon. The 280 billion bill, designed to boost the U.S. semiconductor industry and to accelerate high-tech research, the backers say will be critical to the economy in future decades. Folks, I told you, this is nothing than another scam. The chip industry makes insane profits. Intel made over $20 billion in profits, not revenue, profits last year. They can build their own factories easily. But once they realize that the government can do corporate welfare, they spent millions of dollars lobbying to make sure that they don't have to build these factories and these investments on their own. Let the taxpayer do that job. And of course, the taxpayer gets nothing out of this deal. And oh, by the way, politicians, if you're going to stand against the CHIP Act, we're going to blackmail you. Intel CEO says he's not going to invest until the CHIP Act is passed first. Otherwise, God forbid, the CHIP Act is not passed, he will divert his investment of Intel from the United States to other countries. Meanwhile, they can use the billions of dollars worth of profits that they have for share buybacks to get richer, for the executives to buy stocks and then use their profits instead of building factories to buy those shares back and make money, make profits out of it. This is a Ponzi scheme, folks. And it's happening right before our eyes and nobody's saying anything about it. Everybody pretends that this is the new normal. The government just steals, flat out steals taxpayer money and hand that money to their oligarch donors and the corporations and themselves. And for you fools who told me that I don't know what I'm talking about because we have to compete with China. China's spending billions of dollars to build their chip industry. We have to do the same. Don't we have capitalism here? Wasn't the deal supposed to be companies make their own investments and they get to keep their profits? Why do we have to flip the bill and get nothing out of it as taxpayers? And when you talk about national security, this is how they dupe you into accepting these kind of scams. Because guess what? Here's the bombshell story that we got today from the Washington Free Beacon. Apparently Chuck Schumer stripped away a restriction in the bill. That restriction said, if you happen to be a chip company, Intel, AMD, whatever it is, and you receive money from this bill, you cannot invest in manufacturing in China because the whole point from this scam is our national security. We gotta do it because of China. Yet somehow they took the provision out. Chuck Schumer took this provision out and they're about to pass the bill. This is not about national security. This is about robbery, theft of taxpayer money. And you're falling for it, you fools. Now let's hear what's Senator Sanders said about this today. Take a look. And I'm talking to the 16% of Americans who have a favorable opinion of Congress. If you can believe it, this legislation may also provide a $10 billion bailout to Jeff Bezos, the second wealthiest person in America, so that his company, Blue Origin, can launch a rocket ship to the moon. Madam President, for all of my colleagues, who tell us how deeply, deeply concerned they are about the deficit. Oh, my goodness. We cannot help working families with a child tax credit. We cannot expand Medicare to cover dental and hearing aids and eyeglasses. We can't build the affordable housing. Bernie, we don't have the money to do that. We got a big deficit. Well, what about the deficit when it comes to giving $52 billion in corporate welfare to some of the most profitable corporations in America. I guess when you're giving corporate welfare to big and powerful interests, the deficit no longer matters. Now that's Rich from Bernie, who voted to pass the other money laundering scheme worth over $40 billion to Ukraine, quote-unquote, it's not really to Ukraine. It's money laundering to corrupt Ukrainian politicians, but most importantly, the military-industrial complex here in this country, the oligarchs in this country, the donors, the consulting firms that happen to be registered in the Cayman Island, who your beloved politicians take fees and contributions from. We went from the PPP loan scam to billions and billions of dollars 
in stimmies to billions and billions of dollars to Ukraine in money laundering schemes to billions and billions of dollars to the so-called CHIP Act. All of these money laundering schemes, abuse of taxpayer money, insane money printing, racking up trillions and trillions of dollars in the national debt. You think this will come with no consequences at all? This economy is about to collapse. And when it does collapse, these politicians will not even spend a penny on you. They're not going to come to your aid. But when the corporations fall down, oh, we got to save them because they're too big to fail. Folks, I used to think that paying taxes was the most patriotic thing that you can do for your country. You follow the rules, you work hard, you obey the law, you pay your taxes. This is the American way. But now I think that the most patriotic thing that you can do is not paying your taxes and dodge as much as you can legally because paying these corrupt a is the least patriotic thing you can do. They're abusing the money until we have a responsible government them all. Next, let's talk about earnings that we got today. And I forgot to add UPS and McDonald's to the list that I gave you a few days ago, but here it is. We're going to cover some of them. I'm going to cover UPS, 3M, McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Alphabet and Microsoft. Let's start by UPS. We got the report in the morning and the headline reads, UPS margins have been helped by higher prices and limits on discounts, but the courier saw domestic volumes decline. What are they talking about? Here is the income statement from UPS. The revenue year over year was higher by 5.7%. That's good. Expenses were higher by 5.3%, so revenues are growing at a higher rate than expenses, be it the margin is really slim, and therefore the net income was up by 6.5% year over year. So far, so good for the company. The operating margin happens to be 14.27%, but the devil is always always in the details. What was the catalyst behind the so-called good earnings from UPS? And is this catalyst or catalysts sustainable or not? Because while UPS profits and revenues went higher year over year, Here's the problem. The average daily volume of shipments went down significantly year over year. So how are they making money, Maverick, if the volume is down? If the actual business slowed down dramatically year over year? Here's the answer. How about increasing prices? The inflationary power that UPS has. We talked about UPS as one of our inflationary picks last year. They have the pricing power. While volumes went down year over year, the revenue per piece went higher significantly year over year by about 7.3%. You might have noticed the insane prices that you have to pay for shipping packages using UPS. And by the way, that will factor in in companies like Amazon. Amazon has to pay a lot more for UPS. They still use them. But the bottom line here is UPS volumes are down in a stunning fashion, in an alarming way. Look at the trend. You see that in blue? That's 2022, the trend right now, versus the trend from last year. The company's volume trend is way below last year's. In Asia, in Europe, in the Americas, in US, all way below last year's trend. This is a major, major problem for the company. Why? The inflationary pricing power that UPS has is not permanent. At some point, they will lose the pricing advantage. Why? Because the economy is slowing down, the recession is creeping in. So yes, maybe they're charging corporations and the affluent consumer a little more. It's actually not a little more, it's a lot more to offset the reduction in volume. But what happens when those consumers say, you know what, we can't afford it anymore. And oh, by the way, our business is down either way. So UPS, we're not going to pay you the insane premium that you're charging right now. We want a discount. You combine that with volumes being down to begin with, and this is not a good outlook for the company. Now, you might say, well, what about fuel costs? Wouldn't that go down as the economy slowed down, as the recession creeps in? Wouldn't that be good for UPS? The answer is yes. But would that offset the negative impact of the slowdown in volume and consumers rejecting the pricing that UPS is charging. For now, they're able to pass that extra increase in expenses in fuel costs in charging more for packages. Can they continue to do that? What if fuel costs linger higher as the economy starts to slow down and demand starts to slow down? We see the stagflationary force heading UPS, which will cause a recessionary force. That would be the worst case scenario. Given these facts, I cannot be bullish in the company anymore. Next, we have 3M, a stock that I used to own last year, but I had to get rid of it, eating a loss because the stock was not performing. It was part of my dividend strategy, but hey, when the stock continues to go down, it's not really worth it to keep it for the dividend. You take a 4% dividend, but you lost 10% of your investment. What is the point? And my decision to dump 3M is vindicated because... Look at this. The headline that we got today is the company splitting their healthcare business and that will be a spin-off, a new company, a new stock. 
We'll talk about that in a minute, but let's visit the income sheet before we do that. Net sales for the company went higher by 2.77% year over year, but operating expenses went higher by 23.11% year over year. The operating margin was a pathetic 1.26% versus last year's 22%. What does that mean? Out of each $100 in revenue that the company makes, they're keeping only 1.26 cents as profits. This is disastrous, and therefore the net income was down by a stunning 94.88% year over year. Now forget about the stock chart, forget about the valuations, forget about everything besides these numbers. When Warren Buffett buys stocks, he doesn't really care about the stock he doesn't care about the valuation he doesn't care about the technicals he cares about the numbers right now what do the numbers look like he's buying a piece of the company look at these numbers with the net income down by over 94 percent year over year with expenses rising higher by 23 percent year over year with an operating margin of 1.26 percent do you really want to invest in this company i don't care what the stock did today the stock popped higher Okay, no problem. Maybe it was oversold. Maybe expectations were for a more disastrous report. Who knows? But the bottom line is, do you really want to buy a piece of this shitty company right now? Absolutely not. And now they want to spin off the company into two. The new 3M, which will concentrate on safety, transportation, electronics, and consumer segments. And then they're going to have the healthcare segment as a different company. Now, why are they doing that? Here it is. We'll look at the segment information. Sales year over year were negative for all segments of 3M with exception of healthcare, which was barely positive year over year. We'll look at the operating margin. It went negative year over year across the board, even for the healthcare segment, but it remains the highest margin business for the company. So now they're splitting the company into trash, and Trash Plus. Pick your pick. Next, we have McDonald's. What's going on here? The headline reads, McDonald's sales top estimates as consumers continue eating out despite higher prices. And by the way, when you hear in the news and CNBC, Bloomberg, the likes, the company beats on revenue, the company beats on earnings, the top line, the bottom line. That means shit to me. Whatever some analysts' estimates are, that doesn't matter to me. The numbers are the numbers. I don't care about beats, misses that doesn't matter at all we we'll look at the revenues year over year for mcdonald's those went down by three percent we we'll look at the operating expenses those went higher year over year by 20 five percent that's a beat right and therefore the operating margin went down from 45.7 percent last year to 30 percent and the net income was down year over year by 46 percent absolutely pathetic now you could say but maverick the stock is higher today who cares? The stock is going to respond the way it responds. There are mechanical reasons. There are technical reasons why stocks pop or go down after earnings. At the end of the day, look at the numbers. Do you really want to buy this company that is in decline right now? Maybe not right now. Maybe it's going to overperform during the recession, but is this the best entry point right now for McDonald's? My answer is no. My answer is we're going to see lower lows sooner or later because these results are pathetic. Now you could say that these results are pathetic because McDonald's had to eat a loss from their Russian operations. That doesn't matter. Revenues were down by 3% year over year. And by the way, they got out of Russia permanently. So that revenue is now gone. Not a good report from McDonald's by my standards. But let's see Coca-Cola, another name that I own in my portfolio, but I have an update for you. But before we do that, here's the headline. Coca-Cola raised its revenue outlook for the year and reported strong second quarter sales as demand for its beverages remained strong despite price increases. Let's take a look at the numbers, but before we do that, what about the currency impact? The dollar shot up higher in the last quarter. What are the impacts on corporate America? Here it is. The strong dollar shaved off 13 points of Coca-Cola's revenue in Europe, Middle East, and Africa. It took off one point on the Latin America revenues, and it shaved off 8% from Asia-Pacific, and 11% from Global Ventures, and 9% from bottling investments. So this is a major hit already to the bottom line of Coca-Cola, not to mention the inflation cost, the fuel cost. So let's look at the top and bottom line for the company. All in all, operating revenues were higher by 12% year over year, but the cost of goods sold went higher by 28% year over year. This is not a good dynamic, but the good news is expenses went higher by only 6% year over year. But the bad news is the operating margin went down from 29.77% last year to 20.67% percent this year 
All in all, the net income for Coca-Cola went down by 28% year over year. Sure, the currency impact is a problem, but so was fuel cost, so was inflation cost, and so is the recession cost. Now, they might have offset all of that by price increases, but apparently it was not enough because the net income is down year over year by 28%. So can Coca-Cola increase prices by a lot more to offset the currency impact, to offset the recession impact, to offset the inflation impact, to offset the fuel impact? The answer is their ability to increase prices without a backlash is limited because we have a slowdown in the economy. And therefore, I sold all of my Coca-Cola shares today. It's a heartbreaker. I love the company. It pays an excellent dividend. It is a reliable stock, but you got to take your profit somehow. It was a good ride. Maybe we'll catch it again some other day. Next, let's talk about Alphabet. The big goog, what's going on here? The revenues year over year went higher by 13%. That's the good news. The bad news is the strong dollar once again damaged the top line for the company. It would have been 16% year over year, but the strong dollar shaved off three points and therefore we have an increase of 13% year over year. With that being said, this is a massive slowdown from last year. Last year, revenues went higher by 62% year over year. Now we're talking about 13%. Even if the dollar was not in the picture, this is a pathetic performance compared to last year. Likewise, the operating margin went down from 31% last year to 28%. And therefore, look at this, the net income. Surprisingly, Alphabet doesn't provide the percentage, but I got them either way. The net income went down by 13.62% year over year. Not a good report. Now, when we look at the different segments of revenue, the most important one is YouTube. And I warned you that we're going to see a slowdown, a major run in YouTube ad revenue. And the reason is the collapse of the tulip market. A lot of cryptos crashed and crypto ads used to pay prime rate top dollar. Not anymore. But regardless, Google search and other, the revenue for that segment went higher by 13.5% year over year. YouTube ads went higher by 5% year over year. The Google network revenue went higher by 8.71% year over year. All in all, the advertising revenue went higher by 10.11% year over year. But here's the problem. The stock might be reacting positively after hours based on these earnings, but there are mechanical and technical reasons why the stock is popping after hours. The bottom line is when we look at YouTube ads, the most important growth engine for the company. You might say 5% growth rate year over year is pretty good, but not really because 5% in revenue growth from YouTube year over year represents a massive slowdown. The company on average produces about 30% in YouTube ad revenue growth year over year. But you see the trend. It peaked in the second quarter of 2021 and it's now trending down. Even amidst the mini recession that we got in 2020, YouTube ad revenue growth was 6% year over year. Now it is 5%, even below the so-called recession that we got in 2020. What's next? Negative revenue growth from YouTube ads? That's coming and it's not going to be good for the company and it would certainly not be good news for the stock. Next, we have Microsoft. What do we have here? Once again, the damage from the strong dollar is evident. Microsoft revenues were higher by 12% year over year, but if it was not for the strong dollar, it would have been higher by 16% year over year. So the dollar shaved off four points of revenue. We talk about the operating income that went higher by 8% year over year, but it would have been higher by 14% if it wasn't for the dollar. So the dollar took off six points off the operating income of the company. What about the bottom line, the net income? That went higher by 2% year over year, but absent of the strong dollar, that would have been 7%. So again, that shaved off about five points off the bottom line of the company. You can see it per segment. Every single segment of Microsoft took a hit from the strong dollar. But even with that, they maintained positive growth year over year for the majority of segments. With few exceptions, we're talking about Xbox and Windows OEM. But besides that, everything was positive despite the negative impacts of the strong dollar. The most important segment, the crown jewel of the company is Azure. The revenue growth for that segment was 40% year over year, but it would have been 46% year over year absent of the strong dollar. Now, this is a much better report than Google, but there is also the valuations. Google happens to be cheaper than Microsoft. So you have to do your due diligence here if you want to hop in one of these two ships. I wouldn't do either. I think there is more downside to come. But to illustrate for you, the crown jewel of Google is YouTube ads. That is trending down big time. What about Azure? Yes, the revenue is trending down, but this revenue is still maintaining a strong and a powerful trend. 40% growth year over year. That's really impressive, regardless of the trend. What does that mean for me? 
as an investor? What do I do with these numbers? The answer is I'm keeping Microsoft in my watch list. I used to own the stock last year, by the way, but I had to get rid of it. And that was a timely decision. But let's say the stock goes another 10, 20% to the downside if we have a crash in the fourth quarter. I would look at the growth for Azure and Microsoft as a company, but specifically Azure. If the growth rate year over year slows down to, let's say, 38%, 35%, even 30% year over year, and the stock gets punished severely down 20, 25, 30% from this point on. I will not hesitate to pick up the stock once again in my portfolio because this is a growth engine and the recession will hit it, no doubt about it, but it has a significant cushion of 40% growth rate year over year in the most important business. Unlike Google, which has a cushion of 5% in YouTube ads, that's disappearing by the day. So the valuations aside, I view Microsoft as a much stronger company than Google. Anyhow, folks, we're going to move on here and cover the stock market information for you, starting with the performance of indices today. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average down by 222.5 points or a decline of 0.71%. The Nasdaq down by 220.09 points or a decline of 1.87%. And the S&P 500 no different here, down in the red by 45.79 points or a decline of 1.15%. What about the sector's performances today? Leading the pack at number one, capturing the gold medal, utilities at number two for the silver and the bronze, a twofer, healthcare, because the rest are all in the red and the decliners were led by cyclicals communication services and technology it was a defensive theme value theme risk off understandable before the Fed meeting. What about the advance to decline ratios? NYSE, 34% advancing versus 61% declining. The NASDAQ, 35% advancing versus 60% declining. Commodities, what's going on here? Crude futures were actually trading positive earlier in the day, but by the end, they took a dive down and closed negatively. The WTI lost almost one and three quarters of a percent. Brent lost almost 1% for the day. Likewise, the gasoline RBOB went down by almost one and a quarter percent today. But we have winners in heating oil futures up about one and a half percent. And then we have the party boy, natural gas, which was much higher earlier in the day. It actually made new highs, believe it or not. This is, by the way, the fastest resurgence in natural gas futures back to the top in history. What is the catalyst behind that? Well, the European demand. And again, when we look at European gas prices, U.S. natural gas prices pale in comparison. Look at this. The monthly average in natural gas prices over in Europe has actually reached all-time highs. On face value, the price might not be as high as it was back in March, but the average price, the sticky price, has actually made new highs. So we have a lot of talk that perhaps the weaker euro is pretty good for European exports, and therefore you might want to buy the dip in European stocks. How about no thanks, because whatever benefit these companies are getting from the lower euro versus the dollar, that is being more than offset by the increases in natural gas prices. Back to the futures, what about softs? Green across the board, with exceptions. The decline in lumber continues to go on. It lost about 3.5% today. And then we have sugar, pretty much flattish for the day. Yet we have gains led by cotton. Cotton futures scored about 4% worth of gains today. OJ closed the day with gains of about 3.5%. Coffee futures also moved higher and scored gains of about 1.25%. And then we have cocoa futures also adding to the gains with about 1% today. What about metals? Gold is muted along with palladium, but palladium futures are actually cooling off from massive gains recently, at least in the last few days. Gold, it's a different story. Gold has been dormant, moving down, and this is due to the strength in the US dollar. Yet the pop in the dollar today did not deter silver futures from scoring gains of about 1%. Likewise, copper scoring similar gains and closing green for the day. So we have mixed signals here. Gold is down, silver is up, platinum is down, copper is up. As if metals futures are saying we're confused here, we're lost. We need guidance from who? From the Fed tomorrow. Whatever the Fed says, the dollar will move accordingly, up or down. And that move will determine where metal futures will trade next. What about meats? Down across the board, led by feeder cattle futures, which lost about 1.5% today, but so was live cattle futures and lean hogs all down for the day but they lost about half a percentage point in comparison and lastly what about grains what's going on here grains futures popped higher what is the reason behind that who knows maybe short covering but we got earnings from adm one of the top agricultural stocks in the market and that report from adm was good enough 
to make ADM one of the top performers today, in the stock market at least. And it was that cherry on top that grains futures also rebounded higher, but we're seeing sizable gains here. For example, soybean meal futures scored gains of almost four and a three quarters of a percent today. Likewise, wheat futures shot up higher by about four and a half percent. Corn scored gains of about two and a three quarters of a percent. Soybeans futures with gains of about three percent. Likewise, oats futures rebounded by about two percent. Canola scoring gains of about two and a half percent. Then we have modest gains for both soybean oil and rough rice futures. Moving on to the big casino, the options market. What's going on here? The hottest table by far today was Amazon for a change. With about 900,000 contracts traded today for the name, about 56% of those were calls. And then in number two, Tesla, the souffle, at around 850,000 contracts traded today, about 50% of those were calls. And at number three, Alphabet, with around 700,000 contracts, about 55% of those were calls. What about the unusual activities that took place in the options market today? We start with the ticker SPY for the S&P 500. Somebody's calling for more declines to come for the SPY, regardless of what the Fed is going to say tomorrow. Maybe they have some insider information. I don't know. But they bought the 367 puts for the expiration date, August 26, with expectations that the SPY could move down by more than 6% by then. They paid around 3 bucks and 30 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending around $4 million. And again, this could be an insurance trade before the Fed. Somebody just buying protection instead in case the SPY moves down due to whatever Jerome Powell says. Then we have the ticker VXX. This is the proxy for the VIX. Somebody's actually betting that the VIX, the volatility index, will go down. They bought the 20 and a half puts for the expiration date, August 12, with expectations that the VXX could move down by more than 5.5% by then. They paid around 60 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around $500,000. What about the ticker SHOP, Shopify? We talked about the disastrous announcement from Shopify. Somebody's betting for more pain to come. And by the way, the stock just split. Couldn't they wait for the stock to split organically? like it did today. But this is how you know the mania is over. Stock splits mean nothing like they used to, like they should. They mean nothing at all. Somebody's bidding for more pain to come for Shopify. They bought the 200, excuse me, <laughs> that was before when the stock was not split yet. They bought the 28 puts for the expiration date, August 5th, with the expectations that Shopify could move down by more than 11% by then. They paid around one buck and 15 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around $900,000. Now, what about the ticker QQQ, the triple Qs for the NASDAQ? Somebody's buying puts here, bidding for a downside to come, or maybe they're hedging. It doesn't matter. The bet is assuming a risk to the downside. And therefore, they bought the 265 puts for the expiration date, August 12, with expectations that the queues could move down by more than 10% by then. And they paid around 80 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending around $650,000. And lastly, what about the ticker COIN? We have bad news for Coinbase. We'll talk about that in a second in the heat map analysis. But for now, somebody's betting for more pain to come for Coinbase. It was down big today, and somebody's betting for more pain to come. They bought the 50 bucks puts for the expiration date, August 12, with expectations that Coinbase could move down by more than 5.5% by then. They paid around 5 bucks and 70 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending around $3.8 million. Moving on to the heat map analysis what's going on here it was a defensive theme risk off and therefore big farmers doing pretty good utilities doing pretty good real estate the defensives in real estate doing pretty good the consumer staples coca-cola pepsico also performing and for reasons yet to be known gold miners were up for the day even though gold was down gold futures were down who knows what's going on here but what's being sold ahead of the Fed meeting. Banks, big tech, software, chips, the cyclical names, the reopening names. What does that say? The market is hedging. The Fed might actually be more aggressive than all of us are assuming. What if the Fed comes out with a 100 basis points interest rate hike, and then it hints that perhaps they will do a 75 to a 50 basis points in September. And if inflation doesn't go away and doesn't move down by what they deem is appropriate, they might do an emergency meeting in August. If that is the take, then yes, you will see the risk on segments of the map, the tech, the software, the chips, the communication services, the cyclicals all down big. Tomorrow's meeting is a test for the Fed's resolve. It's a test for Jerome Powell. Is he bluffing, playing tough, telling us the last few months 
that he will do whatever it takes to take inflation down. But now that the stock market is down, commodities are a lot cooler than a few months ago. Will Jerome Powell back off and say, you know what, uh, maybe we'll do 75 right now, but then we'll be nimble. And if he says that, he will probably say that, by the way. We will see a shift back to the risk on technology, chips, software, communication services, the reopening names, etc., etc. Now, we also got a downside for Walmart, Costco, Dollar General, Target, all the retail stores down big today due to the negative news that we got from Walmart yesterday and we covered in details in last night's video. I hope that you got to see it. But here's some corporate news for you. We start with Coinbase. We just talked about it. We have bad news for Coinbase. The SEC apparently waking up from the coma, momentarily at least, and investigating Coinbase. The SEC alleges that Coinbase may have illegally sold unregistered securities. I mean, the tulip market is a mess, absolute filth, scams all over the place. It has to be sorted out for the tulip market to become investable once again. And then we have bad news from Ford. You see, all my neighbors, all of a sudden, I'm seeing all of these Broncos all over the place. And I talked to one of them, and he said that the Ford dealership finally got a bunch of Broncos. He actually placed the order last year, and he's finally getting his car. And they're all excited. They're showing off with the Broncos. And what do you know? We got some bad news. The headline from the Wall Street Journal reads, Federal regulators are investigating Ford Bronco over reports of catastrophic engine failure. Wow, what a bunch of geniuses. Can't you wait for the model to at least be tested for a year and then buy the next model? Why the rush? This is yet another symptom of the mania that we got in the economy last year. Everybody's just splurging and buying new cars, and they don't even know what the car drives like. They don't even care. Oh, the Bronco looks cool. I guess I'm going to place an order. Then you get the car, and the engine explodes. It drives like shit. This is the kind of risk-taking, the, the insanity, the mania that we saw in the economy in 2020 and 2021. And now you wonder why we're seeing the consequences. Uh, most of these Broncos, by the way, they'll get repossessed once these geniuses lose their jobs. And then you can get it for pennies in the dollar, in case you're curious about what happens when the engine explodes while you're driving. Next, what about Meta? Meta is about to, re to report earnings this week. And we already have problems and bad news from Instagram, which used to be a hot app. Not anymore. It is absolute trash right now. And Instagram CEO admits that the pivot to these uh, short videos, the TikTok like videos, well, that's not working anymore. The users don't like it. If I need to use TikTok, I'll go to TikTok. I'm using Instagram because I want to be in Instagram. I don't want to be in a TikTok like imitation kind of app. And unfortunately, all of these tech oligarchs, the geniuses that they are, are shifting to the same stupidity of imitating TikTok. You have YouTube now doing shorts, and they're actually encouraging creators to use shorts. You know, a 10 seconds video, hey, look at this chart. I think it's going to go down. Bye. Would you like to see that kind of coverage from this channel? What a colossal of stupidity. TikTok is TikTok. This is why I don't go to TikTok. Instagram is Instagram. YouTube is YouTube. Longer videos, documentaries, podcasts music videos. This is why we're on YouTube, not to watch stupid little videos that mean nothing at all. And even Kylie Jenner is now criticizing Instagram, urging the app to stop mimicking TikTok. Now we got one of the top, uh, what is she? Influencer? Is that a code name for a glorified hoe? Anyways, but she's one of the top uh, followed uh, influencers on the planet. You might want to listen to her because she warned Snapchat, I believe, a few years ago. And now we know that Snapchat is a disaster. If Kylie Jenner is warning Instagram, maybe she's not going to use Instagram anymore. That would be a disaster for the app and for the already disastrous company, formerly known as Facebook, now known as Meta, which is the lizard translation of Facebook. Anyways, moving on to the heat map for the ETFs. What's going on here? Negative across the board. With few exceptions, matter of fact, growth and value were down today. Internationals were down across the board. But we have an ad performance, if you can call it that, because flat is considered ad performance in this kind of day. The XLU, the IYR in real estate, the XLV in healthcare, even biotech, the XBI, is holding ground for now. The bleeding may be stopping here in the XBI. But besides that, pretty much all of these ETFs were down for the day. And then we have the mystery in gold. The GDX for gold miners was up by about 2%. Yet the GLD was down and gold futures were down. So what's going on here with the gold miners? We'll find out as soon as tomorrow. Moving on to charts and we start with the SPY. 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? Now, the bulls 
pretty much lost their theory for double bottom rebound because the Bears won for now with their head and shoulder formation. The chart lost 393.16 of support, but it is becoming slightly oversold on the RSI and the MACD indicators. This is at least from the 30 minutes chart. What does that mean? Even if we have a rebound in the morning tomorrow, we could see this. We could see a pop higher all the way to the resistance at around 393.16. And then, depending on the Fed, whatever they say, we could see a rejection and a move down all the way to the next support at around 385 or even down further to close the gap. Now the bulls are betting for something different. The bulls are betting that Papa Jerome will fix the head and shoulder that you're seeing right now. That whatever Jerome is going to say, it's going to pop the chart higher and it recaptures 393.16 of support once again. Maybe crack above 398, the pal boost, if you may. Now what about the daily chart for the continuous contract? The SPY, it is still hugging the support, the most important support, at around 3,960. But it is consolidating in a bull flag formation. Now, this is not a guarantee that it's going to pop higher because the volume is moving higher slightly. This is a negative pattern, not a bullish one. Likewise, the momentum indicators, while remaining positive, it appears that they might be running out of gas. If that is the case, then we will see the chart moving down. It will lose the support of 3,960 or perhaps even more, the 3,855. But again, the technicals are kind of limited here because we have an important fundamental catalyst, which is the Fed. If the Fed comes out dovish, the bull flag will play out. We will see a continuation of the bullish momentum on the RSI and the MACD. If the Fed comes out bearish, excuse me, hawkish, we've got to figure out all of these zoo animals, then we will see the momentum indicators moving down, ending the positive trend and starting a new negative trend with red impressions on the histogram you're not going to see it right away but that will be the confirmation yet you're going to spot it right away if the chart loses 3855 for support and better yet starts to form lower lows in the pattern it all depends on the fed there is nothing i can do here what about the cues 30 minutes chart what's going on here the head and shoulder formation that the bears were betting on is playing out and the chart lost the important support of 297 and a half but at least from the 30 minutes perspective the RSI the MACD indicators are getting a little oversold meaning we could see a rebound higher a retest of 297 and a half as resistance and then whatever happens happens if Powell delivers you see a crossing above that resistance and a move higher if Powell screws up and he has the tendency of doing so then we will see a rejection and a move down and if that happens we have the gap support at around 289.7 what about the daily chart for the continuous contract for the cues still positive no harm done here still maintaining the support for around 12,207 no problems here at all still maintaining a pattern of higher lows the volume remains below average the momentum indicators remain positive at least for now so looking at this chart you cannot say that that it's going to go down or break pattern of creating a lower low but we have a fundamental catalyst that could indeed do that hence we have limitations in the technical analysis due to that factor but a pop above the resistance at around 12,766 will initiate the summer rally however a loss with the most important support in this case is 11,689 and making lower lows will mean that we have another leg down and there is no summer rally it all depends on the fed the iwm 30 minutes chart for the russell 2000 what's going on here it remains within range the support 178.60 the resistance at around 182.81 i hate to say it for Folks, but this is one of these days where I cannot make a judgment call using the technicals. Because we have the Fed, and the Fed will move the chart one way or the other, depending on what they say. It's not about the decision, by the way. It's all about the conference by Jerome Powell. What about the Dixie? The most important chart to watch tomorrow. The dollar index. This is not a good look so far. It is popping higher. It appears that the dollar has the energy to pop higher above the resistance if it wants to, but it needs the fundamental push by the Fed to do that. If it does, it's not going to be good for gold, certainly not going to be good for stocks. But don't lose hope right away, because despite what we got today, it could be a head fake, it could be bets right before the Fed's beating, but then Jerome Powell comes out, says, hey, 75, then we take a break for August, we come back in September, and we will be nimble. By nimble, maybe we'll do 25, maybe we'll do nothing at all. That is the case dollar goes down stocks go higher specifically the nasdaq and guess who goes higher too gold but we have a conflict here while we have a pop in the dollar today we also have a bullish consolidation pattern for gold forming a bull flag pattern if the fed delivers the dollar goes down and the bull flag in gold will play out and we will get a pop and then we'll take it from there we have encouraging signs in the momentum indicators the rsi 
is firming up again, moving from oversold conditions. Likewise, the MACD indicator is also firming up and showing us green impressions on the histogram. Not decisive yet, but the pattern is clear. This chart is ready to pop. It just needs the catalyst, and the catalyst would be the dollar moving down. What about crude oil, Brent, or hours chart? What's going on here? It appears that the 105.84 is stickier than we thought, the resistance that is. For now, the reverse head and shoulder pattern that the bulls are bidding on remains intact, but why the failure? Why the lack of energy to pop above 105.84 and close above that number for the day. That tells me that traders have a certain level of hesitancy. They want to get the Fed out of the way and then make these decisions. Because oil futures have buyers waiting on the sidelines, but they want to make sure that Powell is not going to be as aggressive as some tend to think that he will be. Because if Powell comes out aggressive with 100 basis points, a more hawkish rhetoric for September, guess what? This will damage the economy more. It will get us closer to the recession, which is inevitable at this point. And a recession is not good for the prices of oil. Simple as that. What about the daily chart for the 10-year yield? What's going on here? It went down all the way to the support at around 2.72. And it bounced from that point on. But it remains within range. The support, 2.72. Resistance at around 3%. A decisive day tomorrow, one way or the other. The problem is... A sizable pop higher in the chart that you see right now will take place for the bad reasons, for a more hawkish and aggressive Fed. But this chart will also crash big with a big flush down candle if the Fed confirms the recession by being too aggressive and ramping up the hawkish rhetoric. You see the paradox that we're in here? The best case scenario for the bulls is more consolidation, more cooling off. No major moves up or down. It is really hard to predict how this chart is going to behave after the Fed. Even if you tell me right now, Jerome Powell will come out and raise interest rates by 100 basis points tomorrow. And he's going to double down on the hawkish rhetoric for September. I cannot tell you with certainty whether this chart is going to respond by popping higher as interest rate hike expectations move higher. Or is it going to crash down because the Fed is being too aggressive by front loading the recession? Let me know what you think in the comments. But here's the TLT weekly chart, the technicals say it should move higher. It is moving away from the negative slash bearish momentum, looking at the RSI, looking at the MACD indicators, and it is creating new positive slash bullish momentum. Bond bears, on the other hand, will look at it differently. They will say if we switch to a line chart, this is a bear flag consolidation. Yes, you're seeing improvement in the RSI and the MACD, but that doesn't really matter. The bear flag is going to play out and we will see another flush down in the TLT. I think the bulls from a technical perspective alone, have the better argument that the TLT should move higher. But who knows? Again, it's all about the Fed. And even if you tell me right now, Jerome Powell will come out dovish. He's going to do the 75, maybe even 50 basis points, and then tone it down in September and say he's going to be nimble. Okay, does that mean that we're going to see growth expectations moving higher again, meaning the 10-year yield pops higher? Or does that mean that interest rate hike expectations will move down? and the 10-year yield will take a leg down, which means the TLT moves higher. It's a really tough call to make. What about the VIX? For our chart, maybe this gives us more clarity. Reading the tea leaves, the VIX made it above 24.29, an important resistance, now support. The bull flag played out. We have positive momentum on the MACD indicator. If that continues to play out, the VIX should move higher, which means the SPY should move down. If that is the case, in the likelihood, at least according to the VIX right now, Powell will actually deliver a disappointment to the stock market. This is at least according to the VIX right now, this moment. Likewise, the VXN, the VIX for the NASDAQ, four hours chart, it is not above the resistance, maybe soon to be support, 32.72. But we're seeing the RSI, the MACD indicators, moving slightly higher, yet not enough to reverse the negative trend. And I hate to bore you, it all depends on the Fed. But if you see the VXN above 32.72 by a lot, cracking above that sloping line of resistance that you see in yellow, in all likelihood the Qs will go down, meaning Powell delivered a disappointment by that time. What about Apple daily chart? What's going on here? After facing the resistance of the trend line, it is moving down. But I see Microsoft, I see Alphabet in the green after hours. So can Apple pop higher in sympathy with all of that? How long will the pop last if it happens to begin with? Could we see a gap in crap? That's plausible ahead of the Fed. But even after the Fed, we have a problem here, which is Apple reporting earnings on Thursday. And unlike Microsoft, Alphabet, and Amazon, this name is heading into earnings blasting higher. Microsoft, Alphabet hit earnings, beaten, bruised, abused, 
down big, and hence the pops after hours. It is the opposite picture for Apple. Apple is hitting into the earnings report with a jubilee, with big gains, with overextended RSI, and MACD indicators. What does that mean? The risk is still to the downside for Apple. Moving on to Tesla, the souffle, 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? It got down all the way close to the support at around 766 and a half. Not quite, but it is consolidating for now. The bulls would argue, look at the MACD indicator, look at the RSI. We should at least get a pop in the morning. Okay. But even if that happens, the bears are going to argue it's going to be a gap and crap because the pattern is a bear flag pattern. This will play out and Tesla will lose the support of 766 and a half and maybe it goes down all the way to closing the gap. The bulls will counter and say, no, we're not going to see a gap and crap. We'll see a gap and a buildup because the buyers are here. The buyers are waiting on the sidelines and this is a good deal at least according to them. The stock a few days ago last week was trading above 800. Now it is down at around 770 bucks. With some of those waiting on the sidelines, that is considered a deal. But I hate to disappoint the bulls and the bears by saying that it all depends on the Fed. The technicals for now don't matter at all. What about Bitcoin, BTC, an hourly chart? What's going on here? Oh, excuse me, this is actually a two hours chart. The trend of higher lows and higher highs has been broken. Now we have a negative trend of lower lows and lower highs. The question is, is it getting really oversold, reaching support, and this chart is about to rebound higher? Well, the support that I'm eyeing right now is at around 20,000 750, which the chart faced as resistance and support before. Likewise, we're seeing the RSI and the MACD indicators getting oversold, and hence the likelihood for a pop is really decent. But until it gets above the breakdown candle, the top of that breakdown candle that I'm pointing at right now, Bitcoin is not out of the woods. Why? Because Bitcoin has to perform and produce a new pattern of higher lows and higher highs. Otherwise, it's not out of the woods. All it's going to do is pop higher, form another lower high, and then it goes down to form another lower low. Lastly, moving on to the conclusion of this video, what do we have in the economic calendar tomorrow? We have durable goods, we have pending home sales, but most importantly, the Fed meeting and the conference by Jerome Powell. On the earnings calendar, we have Old Dominion, Owens Kerning, Shopify, Boeing, Qualcomm, Ford, service now etsy the most important one meta with that folks i'm done here this is all i got for you for now thank you for listening thank you for watching i will talk to you again tomorrow